out into this horizontal space, all of a sudden your work is the business. Okay, well I now own this thing, or I'm a co-owner of this thing, how do I keep it going? How do I make it happen? I've got to manage lots of things that may not be fully technical. Okay, we've got this person and this other person kind of got at it in a meeting, now I have to manage that to make sure we can still hit our objectives. It's more about managing the people and their relationships than it is about you know, technical knowledge and expertise at that point. So, when we, so that's, that's, that's where the verticals versus horizontals actually comes into play, is that your work becomes the business. So for instance, when I started off in consulting, I started off in our firm just as one of the consultants I had an area of expertise. It happened to be doing a lot of work with helping people understand the information they have in front of them and help them make good decisions from it, whether that was survey information or personal relationships or accounting information, just helping them figure out what they were doing with it. And then uh, about three and a half, four years ago, I became an owner of the company. And all of a sudden, I still had to manage my own book of business, but the perspective changed. Now I had to watch over the good of the whole, not just the stuff I, I was originally doing. So that, that's an example there. So um, when you're in your role as a leader, the next thing that we find that's essential is knowing what your values are. Not just your values, but the company's values. As your role as a leader, what you really need to do. We find that there's really, values operate in this sort of non-negotiable space of what we're doing, right? So as you're looking at your role as a leader, what are you really, uh, what do you really value? What are you really clearly, what, what's your purpose in the, in the larger company? And how do you make that work? Uh, so your, your values are really your true distinctives and your core deliverables. All those things go together. Those are the things you have to do to make the company work. A lot of times people say, well, our values are this. We want to be this. We want to be that. A lot of times what that is is that's our ideal self-talking. That's not really our values. Our values are the things that if we, if we didn't do them, all of a sudden we wouldn't have a business. If we, didn't, if we didn't act in a certain way, all of a sudden our business would just go away. For instance, in our company, our values, we say, are listening, and then helping, and then learning. So why am I here today? Well, one of the reasons is I had coffee with you and said, hey, how can we help? What are the needs that you see? And we, we talked about it. Hey, the team seems like something to be really needed to have. So I said, OK, well, then how can we help there? And, hey, a seminar sounds like a good way to go. So then learning back from you as, I, as the survey comes back at the end, is something to say, okay, well, what was helpful, what was not helpful? What are areas where we might be able to, to help you all? What are areas where you can say, hey, Matt, you totally whipped on that part of that seminar. <laughs> and we do it better next time, right? So that, those are our values. But if we, if we start by just talking, then we violated our listening value. We just start saying, hey, here, I'm going to just tweet out whatever I feel like off the top of my head, uh, then you know, who knows what's going to happen. Um, so at, your role as a leader really is to help people focus in on these values and these true distinctives and these core deliverables. When we get to things like process and structure, those become negotiable. You know, because pro you, ultimately process and structure are supposed to serve the end goal, not the other way around. A lot of us get that that backwards, right? Well, we have to send them through this many layers of approval or else. Uh, especially hard for those of us who are solo shops because, you know, we have to fight with ourselves at that point, right? But, um, so the secondary, uh, you know, the things that we're also aspiring to, you know, our goals, you know, hey, we have some goals, but are we really going to meet those versus our core deliverables? So that's part of your role as a leader is being, helping people really be able to identify these things as you scale your team. The people that are going to come in new, and they're going to have a different process. By adding a person, you're going to change your structure. Um, they're going to have their goals, and you're going to see yourself differently than perhaps they do. Uh, but really focusing on this, this upper corner of helping people really drive toward that will help as you scale a team. I think it was actually Dwight Eisenhower that popularized this, this quadrant. How many of you seen, have seen this before? The, do, the, the urgent versus important quadrant. Anybody seen this before? I've got a couple of head nods here, a couple of hands up. Okay, so most people haven't seen it before. Um, when you prioritize your tasks, 
there are things that just leap out to you as urgent, 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 right? Uh, you have to get them done. Um, you, you know, uh, hey, the, the light popped on in my car, I need to go get gas or else I'm not going to make it to Chicago today, right? Uh, that's urgent, right? It's also important if I'm supposed to go to Chicago. Uh, you know, if, um, if something is really urgent but it's not important, somebody knocking, you know, something knocking, somebody knocking on my door is just wanting to tell me a joke. Well, they're knocking on my door so it becomes urgent, but they're just here to tell me a joke. Well, that's not maybe perhaps as important as something else, right? And so then you have the stuff that's important but it's not urgent. Well, we need to take care of that, but you don't want to defer it indefinitely. And then there's the stuff that's not important and not urgent, and so those are the things we just say, hey, let's not do that. Uh, so as a leader, one of the things that's important for you to do for yourself and for the folks as you scale your team is helping people figure out what's important for you as a leader first. And then you can help everybody else figure out what's important for them, what's on your team, right? If you don't know yourself, if you don't know what you're supposed to be doing, it's hard to tell other people what they need to be doing. Um, you know, if I, I have small children at home, and sometimes, sometimes I realize they can't process more than one or two things steps ahead. They usually can only process the step I'm telling them to do right then, and then they need the next one. Um, and it's funny because a lot of times in our companies, it's the same way, right? Um, it's not that people are dumb, it's just that if we send too much stuff at them, they have trouble figuring out which thing we want them to do first. So um, that's one of the things we often work on with folks. So you do the stuff that's urgent for you and important for you. You delegate the stuff that's urgent but not your core work, right? So maybe your job is the business at the top. So you can delegate the stuff that's it's urgent to get done, uh, but it's not important for you. It might be important for the company, but not for you right at that moment. So then, so what do we do with this? You know, we all have stuff that we, we, we that comes across our plate where we don't want to deal with it every day, right? Anybody want to name something that you have to do every day and you're like, okay, seriously, this again? Family. No, I'm just kidding. Family. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Collect mail. Yeah, collect mail. Yeah, that, that's sort of like, okay, yeah, we have to do this every day. So one of the things as you scale a team is to consider your role as a leader is also to think about what gives you energy and takes your energy, right? And just try to start moving this line down, that's where the arrows are there, so that you're doing more and planning more uh, in percentage, by percentage of your time than the stuff you're trying to do that takes your energy, right? You delegate stuff that still needs to be done um, and then you delete the stuff, you just get rid of it. It doesn't need to be done by anybody, right? Um, and so the, the problem is a lot of us spend a lot of time trying to figure out, well, what do we need to do first? And then we discover that there's stuff that we're still having to do because it's our job, but it's taking our energy. So as you're scaling a team, one of the things to think about is how you can put people in place where, it actually, where the kind of work that takes your energy actually is the kind of work that gives somebody else energy. Okay, so for me, uh, I like to set systems up, but then for me, if I once I've got a system set up and going, I get bored, and somebody else can kind of maintain it, and I know that about myself, especially after ten years of consulting. If I have to go back and do the same thing over and over and over again, it just drives me absolutely crazy. I have people in my company now where doing the same thing every day, every day, every day, every day is the thing they love, and if they get disrupted from the doing the same thing every day, they they kind of they kind of have a freak out. Right? And so I know that those are the people I can say, hey, you take this thing that's driving me crazy, and it's something you're going to love doing. And so we balance each other. Okay? Um, you know, it's, it's the kind of idea that, you know, maybe it's not the job I want, but somebody has intentionally gone into business to pump out porta potties. I mean, right? There is always some work that has to be done that somebody finds valuable enough that they want to do it. That's not me with the porta potties, to be honest. But, you know, it, I know it's kind of gross, but most of the time it's kind of gross. But somebody started a business that does that and developed the technology that does that, right? <laughs> so, um, so then when we delegate, what are we who are we delegating to? 
As a leader, one of the things we're paying attention to is the delegate's comp competency and the priority for them. So as a, as a leader, we're saying, well, if, there, if that person has high competency and if it's a high priority for them, they're the right person to give it to. If that person has low competency, then that's the wrong person. It might be urgent, but we've probably, we're trying to delegate it to the wrong person if, if they're not going to be confident in it. If we delegate to somebody and they have high competency, but it's a low priority for them and their work, they'll get to it eventually, and they'll probably drive us crazy because they're not getting there. They're not getting there. They're not getting there, right? They're able to do it, but it's not their priority. And then, of course, if we've got something that's a low, low priority and the, per, the people we have aren't very good at it, then we really have to ask ourselves as leaders, why are we doing this in the first yeah, one of, the, one of the challenges in, in scaling a team is making sure there is permission for people to make mistakes and permission for people to fail. Where people can admit their mistakes and they feel safe to do so. Um, because otherwise what happens is you get the blame game. Everybody starts pointing fingers and, oh, they caused it, they caused it, they caused it. Um, and it starts sounding like Congress after a while. Um, <laughs> and we know how efficient that can be. Um, so, um, you know, it, it, that's 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 where we're uh, that's where it's important. Um, but that question of why are we doing this is a question that really fits not only delegation but it also fits with role def differentiation, which is our second area we're going to get into here. Um, there's really only one slide here because the information is pretty basic, but it's surprising how often role differentiation becomes muddy, in in, in especially in smaller companies. But it really doesn't matter the size of the company. It matters really how well the team leader, even in a large company, is managing the team. You know, so to start with the overall purpose, why are we doing this? Who's really got to be involved? A lot of times people say, well, yeah, we need to get this done. And then there's the whole crickets thing, right? Nobody, nobody wants it to be assigned to that. Nobody wants to take charge of it. It's just sitting there, right? Or, hey, we're involved, but we didn't realize we needed to involve somebody else, and all of a sudden there's conflict about that, right? So role differentiation is really important. What are we trying to achieve? What's our time frame? What's our process? And how do we measure that we've gotten there? That's the big thing with role differentiation. In smaller companies, I see two things going on, especially younger, younger smaller companies. I see two, one of two things going on. Either role definition is so well-defined Everybody's got their lane, and nobody can get out of it because this is so and so's area of expertise. Maybe, and maybe it's totally legitimate. Maybe they have the, the patent. Maybe they did the dissertation. Maybe they did. They have that specific technical expertise, and so they stay in their lane, making sure everybody's clear on why they're doing something, who's involved, what the goals are, what their time frame is. And so, typical job descriptions don't say all this in there, do they? You just say, well, here's your duties, other duties are assigned, right? Well, usually the other duties are assigned, then it becomes the thing you're doing all the time. Uh, so that's where the uh, role definition differentiation is important. And so really, in selecting the right people, you'll notice that there's this, this, these steps of people involved in companies, right? So you have the, the kind of the pre-employment phase and the employment phase. You recruit and select an offer. That's all the pre-employment stuff. And then you have onboard, incentivize, and exit. Those are that's that's the once you've employed them. Uh, any HR professionals in here that want to refine this at all? Any thoughts? Add or subtract? Do you get capitalists on it? Yeah. Um, so really, selecting the right people starts by making sure we're looking in the right place. I know a lot of companies are here in Research Park because they want to be able to attract university affiliated people or their university affiliated to start with and so they want to be able to find folks there. I also know that uh, certain roles in companies um, that every company needs probably aren't are, are, are going to be too expensive if you're going for somebody who's got that U of I credential for instance. So so in our company you know we, we work with high level leaders and all of that but uh, to be honest the last time we had to go look for a bookkeeper we did it through a, a, a temp agency. Because we knew we needed to pay somebody uh, at a, at a uh, bookkeeper rate, 
rather than at a uh, CFO rate, right? I mean, that, that was, there was just a difference there, and so we, we started looking there uh, for that, because we also knew that we were very, very part-time. Uh, efficiency is nice, but it also means it's harder to hire somebody for five hours a month than it is <laughs> for, for something a little bit more uh, powerful. Uh, and so then the, sec the second piece is selection. You know, every, all of us, when we start, first start looking for somebody, do they have the right technical skills? What kind of technical skills do we need? And that's really important, and that's a good first level cut. Do they have the technical skills they need that we need? Trick is a lot of times technical stuff can be taught. The other two pieces are a lot harder to get. So we spent most of the time today on really on talking about your role as a leader because that is essential before you can scale a team is knowing who you are first. Knowing what you want other people to do is the next thing. What, what role do they need to have? Uh, did you get the right, then, then it's a matter of how do you find the right person for those roles that you differentiated. 